Okay, okay so a Andrew, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, um, as as a, a, I, you know, I've been uh, involved with sort of what I call alternative knowledge um, for quite a few years. Um, my background is actually in something called software engineering, um, <clears throat> which is basically computer programming. Uh, but also, you tend to get involved more in the project life cycle, which invol involves doing some software design, development, and then debugging. And uh, you know, you tend to get involved more in systems integration, uh, where you're on on site, you know, putting things together, trying to make things work. Um, so that was the sort of work I was involved with for about 20 years. Uh, running in the background, I, was, I got involved with bits and pieces of education. I used to run a course in C programming, which uh, the C programming language, I, I ran that as an evening class at a local college for three or four years. And then I ended up uh, getting into full-time uh, further education, uh, teaching on BTEC and HND courses. Uh, and I now work part time for the Open University. Um, and so, you know, I tried try to look at things analytically. Um, I try and break things down, you know, in that, in that sort of way, try and find out why things don't work or, you know, why things do work and uh, this sort of thing, troubleshooting. And I found uh, that these engineering skills uh, are actually quite applicable to to studying what's called alternative knowledge and I found that uh, there are a number of other engineers working in the field and they also seem to have, uh, you know, I seem to identify very strongly with those people as being people who are honest and uh, able to, to p deliver some useful analyses uh, to other people. Um, but I, I first got into this looking at the UFO cover-up. It was in 2003 that I realized the UFO cover-up was real. Uh, and there really was something going on, almost certainly involving extraterrestrial beings in some part of the picture. Um, and I'd, you know, I'd read bits and pieces before then, but it was Stephen Greer's Disclosure Project, which I discovered in 2003, which was a major event. Uh, it was, wasn't really covered in the media very much. In fact, the BBC story from 2001, because I discovered it in 2003, yet it happened in 2001. And I discovered the BBC's reportage of it, and the, the, the actual disclosure project event that I'm referring to was a, a press conference involving 21 uh, witnesses. Um, you know, it's worth me just outlining the story of one of those witnesses that I've told many times in these podcasts, and it's the, the story of Robert Salas, Captain Robert Salas, who worked um, as a launch uh, officer um, in the Minuteman missile program in North Dakota. And uh, he described uh, to the assembled people at the press conference in 2001, May the 9th, 2001, how he was in a capsule 60 feet underground. He was um, in charge of uh, a flight of missiles which were, you know, ready to be launched at an enemy, i.e. the Soviet Union. And he got a report from the top side that there was an object hovering over the um, over the base, and it, it was a, an orange glowing object. And he told the chap to, you know, uh, call him back when he had something serious to report. A few few minutes later, the the chap calls him back again, and said that this object was still there, and they'd drawn their weapons to point it at the object. Um, and uh, then at that point, Robert Sala says that. Uh, 18 out of the 20 missiles which he was in charge of went into a no-go condition. They became unlaunchable, and there was no explanation for this. And he found out that uh, this had happened a number of times. Um, and uh, uh, I'm recording this, by the way, so I can I can give you the recording of this later on. Um, I, was, I, have a, I have a Skype recorder which is which is free, which you can use. MP3 Skype recorder is usually pretty good. Um, and uh, so Salas, uh, he he he, found, he he was then, you know, debriefed after this event happened, uh, and the group that he worked for was split up. Um, and he swore at this press conference that his story was true, and he would take an oath before Congress, along with 20 other witnesses who had some of them had similar stories to his. And this whole event, you know, was like lasted several hours and uh, involved uh, probably uh, these 20 people and a few others that were there. 
all very well qualified. You had John Callahan, who was the head of the Federal Accidents Investigation Division, Federal Aviation Accidents and Investigation uh, Division. And uh, he, he also had a similar story about uh, a Japan Airlines case that he was involved with in 1986, for which he had all the documents and a tape recording. Um, so it was, it was proved at that point that there was a UFO cover-up to me. I was, I was in no doubt at that time. What was actually behind it all, of course, I didn't, I, I didn't quite know. I think I know a bit more now, but uh, I knew that it was real. And how does the BBC report this event? It has a very small story on its website saying, UFO spotters slam cover-up. And I hardly think that a person in charge of launching nuclear missiles is a UFO spotter. In fact, he didn't even see the object. So this, was, of course, was useless, pathetic reporting uh, without actually going into any detail or fact and just putting the spin that they wanted onto the story and putting it out there and then mainly ignoring it, which, of course, is, is, is a running theme and has been um, for the, you know, since uh, the mainstream media got established maybe 100 years ago or so. Um, so I suppose that set the scene for me to understand that there really were things being covered up, misrepresented, misquoted, being lied about regularly by the media. Uh, but the big thing with the Disclosure Project, which, you know, again, will perhaps come up later in the discussion, is how it linked together U the UFO cover-up and the energy cover-up. And Stephen Greer said at this press conference that basically he knew that we did not need any fossil fuels, uh, they were all a waste of money and a waste of time because we had technologies already in our possession, um, I think such as those you mentioned briefly in the introduction, something based on what Nikola Tesla was doing, which didn't need fuel. They could, they, they could effectively draw energy from the zero point field or the ambient field or the quantum uh, realm, whatever name you choose to call it, There's several different names given to this. The ether is another one. Uh, and so we didn't actually need to burn any fossil fuels. We could have as much energy as we wanted for as much as the, of the time as we wanted. And the, the, in the essence of what Stephen Greer was saying, he says that one of the factors which shows that that is true is the UFOs themselves. The fact that they are able to come here and they land here and they do things here and they don't run on oil, they don't run on gas, they don't run on nuclear power, conventional nuclear power. And it is extremely important that people understand and realize this, and it is the truth, and it's not just a theory, and it's not just you know some people having strange experiences, it is reality. Uh, and the powers that be have uh, you know taken that information and covered it up so that we will think that such things are not real, and that there is uh, no free energy, uh, and I and, and I and I realised, you know, at that time it was very very important that people understand what you know a, a proportion of the UFO cover up was about. See, I'm starting to um, come to the understanding that within the the, the truth movement, uh, protests, things like that, um, even within a collective of people that. Um, claim to be aware of all the manipulation going on. I don't think a lot of people are aware of the manipulation that goes on within their own circles. Right. And there's a lot of truths out there and um, deceptions and disinformation and you, you don't know what to look through or what rabbit hole to dive into because it's going to take you down another one anyway uh, at, at some little point. Right. But, right. Um, Go on, carry on. Yeah, and I mean, I was just going to sort of follow on with that remark because you're absolutely right, and and, and I've written a whole book about this in in terms of uh, the 9/11 issue, and it's called 9/11: Finding right. the Truth. That's what I wanted to get onto because, like, when I met you was uh, a few years ago at a Leeds Truthers meeting, mm -hmm. and um, you know, you, your your question to me at the time was. Um, what, what what theory do you think it is? And I was like, well, the most plausible one is the the thermite theory, if I was looking at it. Um, but uh, on the other hand, for, for me, it's like um, a, a part of the big puzzle. But the thing is, there are many, many theories about 9-11. You've got thermite, you've got the bankers, Bush, Freemasons, war, oil. Um, it's all about control, but um 
when people talk about either terrorists or thermite or inside job or something like that, um, what what you bring to the table on 9-11 is something completely different from what your average truther is talking about, isn't it? Uh, yes, uh, that is true. But I think now there's there's more of an awareness uh, of of some of the you know ideas that you were talking about infiltration and being led down a false alley, and the way to get around that and and and, and one of the reasons why 9/11 is so dangerous to the powers that be um, is because you can actually establish what happened. I mean, like you know, I t started talking about the UFO cover up. And it's very, very difficult to establish uh, what's going on with the UFO issue because it is so complicated and it's been going on for such a long time. But with the events of 9-11, if you study it enough, you can establish what happened, right? And you can establish quite clearly that uh, it wasn't terrorists, it wasn't Al-Qaeda, and indeed it wasn't bombs in the building and it wasn't thermite. And I was taken in by that line of reasoning initially, but, it, but as, that was because it was as much because of the people who were putting forward that story. I trusted them, and I didn't think they could possibly be, you know, making up another story. But then I realized over a period of about 18 months that that's exactly what they were doing, uh, and they were actually deliberately and knowingly deceiving people. Um, and the reason why they were doing that was to cover up the energy question, the energy issue. So, you know, certainly in terms of 9-11, you can move away from theory and you can move into a state of knowledge. And you move into a state of knowledge and away from a state of belief or theory by looking at the evidence of what happened. And again, you know, like you say, there's many aspects to 9-11. There's the banking aspect, you know, and as you, exactly the ones you mentioned. You know, and for example, there are the three sites. There's the Pentagon, there's Shanksville, and New York City, the World Trade Center. And just taking those three sites, it becomes patently obvious if you look at it that Shanksville, there's very little evidence of what actually happened. There's a bit of video, uh, a couple of photographs, and some witness testimony. And that's about it. Um, uh, when you go to um, the Pentagon, there's a bit more witness testimony. Uh, there, are, there is a little bit more, uh, you know, a few more photographs and so on. Um, and a, a little bit of video, not much that's really you know of any significance. And um, and uh, but when you go to the World Trade Center, there are vast quantities of evidence, enormous quantities of evidence. You have 40,000 pictures. You've got 52 different videos. You've got seismic data. You've got um, you know r r physical remains of the World Trade Center. You know that, you, that are actually w were recovered. Uh, and taken to certain places. So you have all of that evidence that you can study, uh, and a lot of it is available in the public domain. And um, what you, if you really want to know what happened, you need to get somebody who knows what they're talking about in terms of uh, studying what happened at the World Trade Center. And that particular person, the only person who's, who's, who's done that really with any, any credibility is Dr. Judy Wood. And she is a former professor. She has three degrees. She's an expert in materials engineering science, um, mechanical engineering. And, um, uh, and she, she taught those subjects at undergraduate and postgraduate level. Um, and she has uh, done that research over a period of, uh, well, essentially 10 years. Um, she started to post stuff on the internet privately, essentially, or not exactly privately, but just to share some pictures and so on with a couple of colleagues in 2004. Um, and in 2006, th that sort of developed into a larger website with a few uh, sets of pictures, which she was uh, putting together to form an overall uh, analysis of what happened. Um, and uh, then in 2006, it, it, you know, it started to, to sort of come about that uh, she realized at that point that what she was looking at was not the result of plane crashes. It wasn't the result of bombs going off. It was a result of some type of energy. Um, I don't think I think I'm new, I would say discharge, but that wasn't the word that she used. She used I think she used the word impact at that time. And at that time, she didn't even know that such things as directed energy weapons existed. Um, and um, that was the eventual conclusion that she came to, you know, um, 
two and two and three years uh, beyond 2006, that, that that was the conclusion that she she came to that that, that directed energy weapons were the prime, uh, uh, you know, the prime sort of destructive uh, mode uh, of of weaponry that, that that destroyed the World Trade Center. It was an energy uh, weapon. So let, um, let let me get this clear, Andrew. It's um, you, you, what you're saying is it's not aeroplanes that. No. Caused the destruction of the tw twin towers. Correct. On September 11th. Correct. So. Okay. So what what caused it? What exactly was it that that caused it? Well, I mean, you know, the, the, the people want to jump to the answer, and Dr. Wood is very careful to try and go through the evidence um, before jumping to that answer, because the problem is that when I start coming onto these broadcasts and, and, and you know and come out with these statements people who are not familiar with what I'm talking about just think I'm I'm talking about science fiction it's just they've just never heard of such a thing they, they've never heard of uh, an energy weapon or they might have heard of it on Star Trek or something and then we have people on the internet you google Dr. Judy Wood and, and before too long you'll come up with come across this phrase space beams or ray beams from space uh, and this was a term that was coined uh, uh, early on but what what you know to answer your question you, at this point are, what, you, are you are you saying that because like the way i understand it, what you're saying is um some kind of frequency device um destroyed the twin towers and, and blew it into pieces now what what I, I and i love looking at tesla's work and i think it's phenomenal um you, you only have to have a look at what the military are, are using um, also, the sort of technology that they're using on protesters uh, with frequency devices, and that they've got these, they, they look like little mini radars or satellites on top of a, a vehicle, and they can point them in the direction of a crowd that uh, they need to disperse, and they turn it on and they, they say it's um, a right, non... Well, sure, sure. Oh, I mean, there, there are two different systems there, which we must distinguish between. The first one is the LRAD unit and that's an audio device I think it stands for long range acoustic uh, defense or something or deterrent or yeah, something. Yeah. and that that basically fires a, a beam of uh, you know high energy sound and it, and it can deafen people so that's one of the devices that's been used I, I believe it's been used in uh, was deployed in New York City a couple of years ago um, so that's an audio based device and then there is the other one that people have heard of which is uh, my nickname for um, uh, certain members of the truth movement, and it's it's called the active denial system. Uh, most people uh, want to talk about 9/11, uh, want to talk about terrorism and stuff. They have they have their own active denial system, which is the denial of evidence, which shows that sort of things cannot happen. But that's a different type of active denial. The active denial system is, is uses microwave energy, and it heats up the skin of the, the people that it's aimed at, and therefore you know causes them to you know cry out in pain and run away from 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 the weaponry um, so that's 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 actually creates heat now if you want to find out what happened to the World Trade Center you have to look at the evidence which is which is catalogued in the videos that are on uh, the Dr. Judy Woods put together or I have put together quite a number of those videos um, there's one called um, where did the towers go and that was filmed at St. Anne's in, uh, in uh, the northeast of England. We've got a video of that on my website. There is another uh, video which has just been posted in the last uh, week or two by the guys in Holland, and it's uh, the Breakthrough Energy Movement uh, Conference, which took place in November last year. Dr. Wood did a two and a half hour presentation, and you can, you can find that now posted in high definition on Vimeo. I'd recommend if people want to see the full details of what I'm talking about, you, it, those viewing those presentations is, is strongly recommended, and even more strongly recommended if you can if you can afford it is to get hold of a copy of Dr. Judy Wood's book, Where Did the Towers Go, uh, which has all the evidence in there, and it will show you exactly how the World Trade Center was destroyed. And when you've read it, there won't be any theory left, you, there won't be any doubt left. You will know as a person what happened to the World Trade Center and you will understand to a very uh, large extent how it was done and you, you will uh, understand to some extent how the technology which was used works right so, so that, um, so that, also, that book, 
if I just may finish that point, the, yeah. the, that book is a reverse engineering of what happened to the World Trade Center. It doesn't really discuss what happened at the Pentagon much. I think it's mentioned on one or two pages. And it doesn't discuss what happened at Shanksville. It doesn't discuss, you know, the bankers. It doesn't discuss Bush. It doesn't discuss, you know, Zionists or Bilderbergers or any of that stuff, um, you know, which is all very interesting and there's certain documents and so on. But, you know, what, what that book proves is, is what happened to the World Trade Center. It's not a theory and it's not a belief. It is court admissible evidence and indeed some of it was taken to court, which is not the case with any of these other theories which have been spoken about, such as thermite, nukes, mini nukes, micro nukes, neutron bombs, fluoride, um, uh, you know, uh, C4, RDX, remote control planes, all the people who have talked about all of that stuff, none of them have put any of that into a court case because it's just a theory. Dr. Judy Wood and Dr. Morgan Reynolds have put their evidence into a court case and that was submitted to the Southern District of New York in 2007. And all those documents are posted on Dr. Judy Wood's website for people that want to go and look at them. So what sort of evidence has been submitted? Because I've, I've seen via your website and um, through your presentations and that, that um, on the same day or that week that um, was leading up to 9-11, mm -hmm. there was a hurricane, Hurricane Erin. Right, that's right. Um, and that was going along the coast. And right, the right. Well, let, well we, before we go to that, I think it's, we'll just get a, you know, a summary of what actually happened to the World Trade Center because people, uh, there's all sorts of you know, languages used and people don't actually know what happened. So let's, let's just say, say what, what actually happened. The first thing that happened is the buildings did not collapse, all right? And I used to think they collapsed, and I, I used to use the word collapse, and I say, oh, they collapsed in 10 seconds each, which is impossible. That's actually not what happened. It, they actually turned to dust. And if you look at the evidence, you will see that approximately 85% of those buildings turned to dust in approximately 10 seconds. So the point is they didn't even hit the ground in, in a solid form. And you can show that they didn't hit the ground in solid form because A, they mostly turned to dust and you don't have uh, the required proportion of debris. There is some debris. There are some solid pieces of steel in the street. I didn't say 100% of the building turned to dust. I said about 85 to 90%, which means that you have about 10% roughly of steel girders and so on, you know, strewn across the streets of New York, and the other 90% or so, 85, 90%, is dust in the wind. There are no toilets, there are no computers, there are no um, large pieces of piping, there are no lifts, there, are, there, there, is, there is nothing, nothing remaining of the huge radio mass that was on top of the, one of the towers. There, is, there are no pieces of glass, there are no desks, no phones, there's nothing in that debris. It is claimed that the debris was shipped to China, but if you look at the pictures on Dr. Judy Wood's website, you'll see that there was no building left by 2 o'clock in the afternoon on 9-11 itself. There was no, almost nothing left. The, the, the so-called debris pile was less than one story high in most places. So the, the, the disappearance of the building just for a start off, cannot be explained by any conventional means. Because if planes hit the building, cause it to burn, and the steel to weaken, and the building fell down, the building would be there when it hit the ground, agreed? But what you'll find is the building is not there, and indeed there was almost no seismic signature. There was no seismic signature, or very little, it was about 2.6, which, which in proportion to the size of the building, was, was almost nothing, and, and, and the, the World Trade Center towers were constructed in something called the bathtub, which was like a, a concrete slurry wall, and uh, that bathtub was not damaged by the collapse, I say collapse, the falling down, the disappearance of 210 story buildings. In fact, the Port Authority, when they were cleaning the thing out, was more concerned uh, to with the, 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 the uh, damage that the earth moving equipment would cause to the slurry wall than the, than the disappearance of the buildings. The malls, the shops, there were shops underneath the, the main World Trade Center in the nine stories uh, below the World Trade Center, there were shops underneath. Some of those shops survived intact 
and, and, and uh, um, various uh, goods were recovered from some of the shops. How is it possible when you had 500,000 tons, half a million tons of building coming down? How is it possible that 14 people in stairwell B survived uh, with the, this, these, the, you know, 500,000 tons of building came down? How are these things possible? How is it possible that you had 1,400 toasted cars, some of them with engine blocks melted uh, half a mile away from the World Trade Center? Um, how is it possible that people were levitated and carried a block such as David Hanscher, the New York, uh, New York Daily News photographer? Uh, I, we have several reports of people being levitated. How is it possible that some cars were turned upside down whilst others right next to them remained the right way up? How are these things possible? These things are so not... What, what, what you're saying is that um, the, the uh, Hurricane uh, Erin is a uh, field component to uh, some kind of energy device that would have wiped it out with a frequency rather than um, any thermite or uh, fire theories. Well, that's it. I mean, you know, it's the, 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 the things like conventional explanations such as, uh, uh, you know, um, you know, any any sort of kinetic uh, system such as uh, bombs or thermite, you know, making things go off, it, it can't do what was done. The thing, when you look at the evidence of what was done, that's why it's so important in a forensic investigation. You don't just go into, uh, you know, a, a murder scene and say, oh, well, it was clearly he, he was shot. You know, when he hadn't even looked at the body and he hadn't even looked what sort of damage there is to the body, you know, to see if, see if it's a strangulation, uh, you know, you say, oh, oh, it's clearly the person was shot because you see this gun in the room. You've got to know if the gun was actually used and, uh, you know, whether the, the, the bullet was fired at the body and so on. And, and a lot of these other theories, when you look at them, they're, they're equivalent to, uh, you know, looking at the, uh, the scene and just saying, oh, it was probably that then. And they're not actually taking into account all that was all that was was there um, so that's why you have to start by looking at the evidence and then and then you go forward from there and and the the overall result that you come to when you see these effects building up and building up for example these weird fires you could see that it wasn't just like a single energy beam you know which some people say oh, it was like oh are you saying it was a laser beam then no are you saying it was a microwave beam well not in the conventional sense because a microwave beam creates heat in whatever it's targeted against. And, it, and clearly that's not precisely what happened, because some people were in the towers and they, they walked out. You know, they, they, they were in the midst of what happened, like the people in stairwell B, but they weren't cooked. They weren't, uh, you know, their skin wasn't burned off them. And there actually is very few reports of people being burned. Um, so you're looking at something else which is completely hidden. It's, com it's completely so classified. People have never even heard of it. Where would this frequency have come from then? Don't know. We don't know. We don't know. And it's just the same as if you you see a, a dead body in a room that's been shot, you only have a general idea of where the gun gun was if you know, it's shot from a long range. You may not know exactly where the gun was, and you may not know exactly what type of gun was used, but you know that it was a gun. And this. And if um, Erin was a field component, as, as you believe, would, would would that have been created by the powers that be? Then? Well, we don't know. I mean, there are only certain questions we can answer, and you know, we're trying to work our way towards Erin, um, which does does appear to be involved, but it's not entirely clear exactly. But yes, a field component is the expression which I think I termed, because what if you read Dr. Judy Wood's book and I'll look at the the videos and so on. Um, that are on the internet you and watch her go through the evidence and watch the whole two hours you will see how this thing stacks up and basically what it looks like is um, the destruction of the buildings wasn't instantaneous the, the process started around about uh, around about the time that these supposed uh, plane crashes happened and that they weren't planes by the way um, and again, you have to study the evidence to find out that they, they cannot have been planes. But it appears that the buildings basically were, underwent some type of um, dissol dissolving process. It's like the material in the buildings, most of the material started to be dissolved over a period of about an hour or two, an hour and a half. And this was used using a combination of energy fields. Now, we've seen something similar um, 
And this something similar was the connection was made by Dr. Judy Wood in late 2007 when she started looking at something called the Hutchison effect. Um, now John Hutchison is a Canadian experimental researcher who has been trying to, you mentioned Nikola Tesla, and John Hutchison had been trying to reproduce some of Nikola Tesla's work uh, since about 1979. And he'd collected together ex uh, sort of uh, naval equipment. He'd collected together signal generators, radar equipment, RF generators, uh, waveguides, uh, things like a Van de Graaff generator, Tesla coils, as you mentioned, which generate a, a high voltage static electric field. And basically, he found that by by you know switching on the Tesla coil, maybe firing a couple of RF generators at it, and then introducing another energy source such as a microwave beam. In the area, in the region, in his in his in his you know in his apartment in his laboratory, where these energy fields were intersecting, various effects would take place, and those effects became known as the Hutchison effect later, uh, and such effects as uh, jellification of metal. Metal would apparently sort of you know just it looked like it had been heated up, but when you when you touched the metal after the the, the sort of jellification had taken place, it was cold. Uh, things would fly up in the air. Some things would even disappear. Some things would sort of break up into pieces. And we've got video of this happening. There are, there's a number of videos of this. Um, but initially, John Hutchinson wasn't able to reliably reproduce these effects. In fact, only about 10% of the time was he able to set these things up and get them to work. He also experienced uh, things like weird fires, spontaneous fires with fire coming out of uh, thin air. And, uh, and again, we've got some videos of this. This boat experiment they did in 2006. Um, so weird fires was, an, was another effect that was seen at the World Trade Center. We have uh, uh, pictures of these strange car fires. We have some video of them. We have uh, the testimony of Patricia Ondrovich, who said she was walking down the street and um, the, the cars were exploding uh, and so on. And her, her, her overcoat caught fire, uh, but it, she wasn't burned. Um, and so all these effects were being seen in John Hutchinson's experiments were seen uh, at the World Trade Center in the destruction of the pardon me, in the destruction of the towers uh, and all that is catalogued in Dr. Judy Wood's book on my website and on her website in the presentations that we've done um, and the other thing that she discovered in, in around about uh, uh, February January February 2000 and uh, eight is uh, is that uh, she she discovered this hurricane. She was basically trying to analyze what uh, was the fumes were doing from the World Trade Center. They were rising up into the air, and uh, she decided she would go and hunt down some satellite photographs to see if she could see the plume of material uh, wasn't smoke um, from the World Trade Center. And then she discovered uh, these pictures of Hurricane Erin, uh, which was 500 miles off the coast of New York. Um, and uh, this peculiar thing is that this hurricane uh, was was first uh, sort of named on around about the 1st of September. And um, it sort of traveled up from the uh, Atlantic and across the Bermuda. I did a bit of damage at Bermuda and uh, then traveled out to sea and CNN on their report said, oh, it's, you know, it's going to travel out to sea. It was nothing to worry about. Um, and uh, basically, uh, it went in a straight line uh, for four days towards New York City. And it ended up closest to New York City at eight o'clock in the morning on 9-11, just immediately prior to the events unfolding. And this fact, and this is a fact, it's not a theory, and you can go and look at the Hurricane Data Center, you can look at uh, the UK Met Office data about it. This really was there, it really did move like that. And uh, what was it doing there? Why did it make a right-hand turn on September the 12th and move off, move off out towards Newfoundland? I've mentioned this to many people and they do not want to talk about it. I've mentioned it to people who talk about chemtrails and weather modification. They don't want to talk about Hurricane Erin. Jim McCanny talks about weather control, doesn't want to talk about Hurricane Erin. Richard Hoagland, 
uh, talks about weather control or has in the past doesn't want to talk about Hurricane Erin. No one, no one wants to talk about Hurricane Erin because to me it is the biggest smoking gun that something extremely important was going on on 9-11 which went way, way beyond anything to do with money or bankers or Zionists or anything. It involved huge things such as geoengineering, weather control, it involved energy. And these are, these are the facts that people need to look at and need to think about very, very carefully. They need to check me out to see if I'm making this stuff up. It becomes very important that you take responsibility for knowing about and understanding this information, not just assuming that I'm telling you the truth. And this is what Dr. Wood and I have you know, essentially tried to do. That's why we've made all this information available. We're not part of any group. You know, we were part of the Scholars for 9-11 Truth group. Um, um, essentially, what we've got to is Hurricane Erin, you know, being there uh, on September the 11th and then not being there. Uh, the point about Hurricane Erin is, yes, it's a storm system. And ev everyone beyond about the age of about uh, five years old knows that uh, storm systems have something associated with them. And that is electrostatic energy, thunderstorms and so on, electrical energy. So when Dr. Wood saw this and she looked at the side profile of a hurricane, it actually looks like a Tesla coil. And therefore, she put forward the idea, uh, you know, this wasn't meant to be cast in tablets of stone, but it's certainly strongly uh, indicative of what Hurricane Aaron was actually doing there. You really have two choices. Hurricane Aaron being there either had a reason or it was coincidence. Now, if you can consider that a hurricane being closer to New York City uh, 8 a.m. in the morning on 9-11 and moving off the next day, if that's just a coincidence, then, uh, well, you know, I, I, most people that I've spoken to when they've seen the data cannot say it's a coincidence. Neither can they say that uh, it was part of a weapon system because they haven't evaluated the rest of the evidence to be able to say that with confidence. I would say that that's what it looked like, what it was doing. That Hurricane Erin was there to provide the electrostatic field component, and it appears from to the weapon system, and it appears from the other evidence in Dr. Wood's book that there was some type of microwave beam involved uh, in, the, in the destruction of the towers, so that was another energy source. And uh, there may well have been uh, radio frequency energy involved as well, which was uh, more difficult to detect. You know, as you mentioned in the beginning, yes, Hurricane Aaron was there. And I described to the listeners that the path of Hurricane Aaron, such as it was, was that it started uh, and was named as a hurricane around about the 1st of September 2001, moved up to, to um, Bermuda, did a bit of damage, and then it traveled in a straight line for four days towards New York City. And there was barely any warning given to anybody. It was barely talked about hardly reported in the uh, in the uh, news media. In fact, on the morning of 9-11, two out of four of the local weather reports for that region um, did not mention Hurricane Erin at all, even though it was had been traveling in a straight line towards the coast for four days. And you only have to compare that with Hurricane Sandy of a few months, a couple of months ago, to see how extremely unusual that was. Uh, but that's that's a there, whole is, of the story. Is, is there any reasons, like off the top of my head, they would um, like certain news channels just not bother reporting on hurricanes because they're so frequent along that coastline? Well, n no, because it, this this that wouldn't be. Yes, they're frequent, but it wouldn't that wouldn't have been a reason not to report it because it was it did pose a threat to property in that area. And we've spoken to a number of people. For example, a chap got in touch with me a few months ago, and I've been in. Uh, contact with him several times since then and he's a, he, he, he's in the surfing world he's actually a surfing photographer and one of the things that surfers do believe it or not is watch out where the hurricanes go because guess what you get an awful lot of surf from a hurricane if it's in the right place of course and uh, he, he, he didn't hear about hurricane Aaron either and he, he said that was extremely unusual so something very peculiar went on with that the reporting of that hurricane but that, that, is, that is speculation. 
as to exactly why you know that wasn't reported. I mean, we could, I, I can say yes. I think it was because uh, somebody set up this storm to move in a certain way uh, and be in a certain place at a certain time. That's certainly, if you look at all the evidence, what it looks like. But seeing as no one has come forward to state that they did do that, and we don't know exactly how that was done, you know, we can't really go much further than observe what evidence there is that actually that did really happen. And I must stress that this is not a theory. I'm not talking about any theories here. What I'm talking about is evidence. And people need to think very, very carefully about the difference between the words theory, evidence, and belief, because it's one of the things that's used to control us. Um, and, and that's how the, the cover-up has worked, and I've written a bit about this in my free book, 9-11 Finding the Truth, and that's available free from my website in electronic format, so you can get a paperback at cost price, which is about 8 quid. You can order that from Lulu. None of that comes to me. It just all goes through Lulu's system. I don't get any royalty for the paperback edition. Um, you can get the Kindle version. You get an iPad version. I've made all those. I've you know, generated all those myself for people who want to have have them do it uh, to have them for their iPad. But um, and I have been looking at this like um, I, I've, I've been saying so many times. It's more like a, a corporate truth movement rather than the truth movement. Oh yeah, and I'll, I'll come on to some of that. How it, how at least in one one point it ties into the military industrial complex in relation to the 9-11 cover-up, and I'll come to that in a moment. But I just wanted to add to, to the audio book uh, to the list, because uh, I produced this 9-11 Finding the Truth as like a PDF file that people could download, and then I subsequently made a Kindle version and an iPad version. All of those are free um, if you go to the right place. Um, and then somebody in New York City uh, actually contacted me and said, oh, I'd like to do an audio book, an audio version of your book because I'd done a computer-generated voice version, which I've got some software here, which I actually use for some of the work that I do, which will read out text in a reasonably good computer voice, but it's still a computer voice. And this person didn't really like the computer voice, so they took it upon themselves to read 300-odd pages of text into uh, a microphone for me, and that's now also available for free on my website so you can stick it on your mp3 player you know and listen to it on the train or when you go shopping or whatever um, that's all available free so we've made all this information available free using our own resources we'll say we're not an organized group and it, all that information is there for everyone to establish what's been going on and I'd just so why like do you do what, what you do then pardon why do you do what you do because I think we have uh, one of the best opportunities at this time to change completely the world that we live in and establish a world which is more peaceful and more equitable. Uh, and, and, and fundamental to that is the control of energy. Now You think if you had as much energy to do whatever you wanted as you needed, how, how different the world would be. You could, you, know, you could, for example, desalinate seawater to your heart's content and irrigate the deserts. You could destroy all the pollution in the world because you'd have as much energy as you needed to neutralize that pollution in whatever form it was into safe compounds. You could use as much energy as you needed to break down you know, complicated toxic substances back into their basic elements. All right? If you could have energy at no cost, you can do all of that as much as you want. Um, and that's what people need to understand. Once you have free energy, you won't have any environmental problems. You won't have the need for money because there won't be any problem with resources. What you're looking at at the moment is we've been conned into thinking we live in a world of scarcity, scarcity of resources. But we don't need to live in that world because we have to understand that free energy is available. And, and the point is about why 9-11 is so important in this picture, which I didn't realize until probably the middle of 2008, is that 9-11 proves beyond a doubt, it's not a theory, that somebody knows how to control energy at a fundamental, I call it an etheric level. That they know two, how to, to engineer the fabric of reality. Yeah, there's two things I want to bring up. Uh, one of them is, uh, you say about the evidence for 9-11 is, uh, well, what is the evidence? Because uh, for someone like myself that hasn't, looked fully into it as much as you have 
um, I, I would look at it and I'll say, yeah, I've, I've looked at what, what you're presenting and I see what you're saying, but I've got no first-hand knowledge to the, of this, so what, what is the evidence? And, um, and I'll come back to the second one after that. Well, I, I've already been through some of that evidence, but I'll go, go through a bit I didn't mention just to illustrate one particular point. There's a particular video that you can see uh, which has been shot from several different angles, seven different people, which has caused uh, the powers that be an awful lot of problems. And that particular video, and I've spoken about this many times, and I'll speak about it probably many times again, there's a particular video that you can watch of 70 stories of steel columns turning to dust in about eight or nine seconds. Okay, That was part of the uh, core columns, uh, I think, of World Trade Center number one. And it's like three inch box girder steel, 70 stories high, 700 feet tall. You see this turning to dust in a matter of 10 seconds. There is no doubt that that what happened. That is not a theory that that turned to dust. It's actually what happened. You can establish this as fact. There, therefore, you then are faced with having to explain what happened in broad daylight. OK, how did that steel turn into powder? And then once you look at all the other evidence and bring that into the picture, you can see that that can only have been done by some classified form of technology. And that classified form of technology allows the material, in this case steel, to be deconstructed at an atomic or molecular level in a short period of time. Somebody has that technology, right? We don't know who that is, but we know that that technology is real. We know that it works. It is not a theory. It's actually what happened, right? So well, you then... That's, what, that's the whole, whole thing about a courtroom is um, it doesn't matter about what, what you know. It's what can you prove to the courtroom. Right. And if you're saying that energy devices have done that, um, it's, it's what I'll put it to you. It's not what you know. What, what, what can you prove? to me that that was done by a frequency device. Ah, oh, now, I, did, I didn't say that it was done by a frequency device. That's your terminology, right? Now, we don't have the serial number True. of the weapon, right? We don't have the, we don't know who did it. We don't know where it was. But what I, I outlined, in the fir, outlined in the first hour is that we have a set of evidence from what happened at the World Trade Center with a number of effects, which I already mentioned, such as levitation, things turning to dust, weird fires, effects of heat seen without uh, next to, you know, presence of heat, what looks like heat next to what looks like no heat, which doesn't make any sense. And there are a number of factors which are in Dr. Wood's videos and books. So rather than ask me to go through them now, you need to go away rather than me, you know, describe them all by voice. You need to go and look at those again. Right, and so, you've heard bits and pieces. You need to study them, right? And then, so you have that, right? The World Trade Center evidence, which I've discussed in brief, and it's in detail in the presentations. And then, alongside of that, you have the effects catalogued in John Hutchison's experiments, which have also been catalogued in detail by a number of people over the last 30 years. They are also in the presentations. They're on another website which I've put together called thehutchisoneffect.com. And you can look at, listen to some of the audios that John Hutchinson has done, look at some of the videos and so on. Uh, and you can look at all of that evidence and you will see there is a one-to-one -one correspondence. All right? So it's a bit like saying, uh, here's the effects of a gun shooting a body uh, and here is this dead body which appears to have the same effects. And okay, cool. so the, what, you, you, like, as I said earlier, there's many, many theories out there like... There are indeed. Uh, for example, but they don't explain uh, the available evidence, so I'm not interested okay. in those theories. Okay, yeah, but what what I'm saying is, like, um, I, I could say, I I I believe that um, the twin towers, 9/11, all that is um, an inside job and a conspiracy yes. mm -hmm. to cover up many different things and to of control control people. Yes, and, I agree. And um, I'm I'm trying to look at. Um, a few other things, like what would be the worldly solutions and who do you think done it? Oh, well, if you want to go to that, then, then we, can, we can start to move in that direction now because we've established what happened, right? And we've established to an extent how it was done. So what do you think? Let's, you know, I said a few minutes ago that this was classified technology. So if I was to say that, where do you think we should go and look for it? Um, 
wherever we left it. Um, <laughs> yeah, good one. Well, uh, well, well you're, you're suggesting at the military, yeah? Correct. So we need to go and look at the military industrial complex, don't we? Okay. Will you agree? Um, I'm, I'm not agreeing. I'm just um, run, running with your ideas. At okay, moment. well, you'd be, okay, you'll be, you're being non-committal. That's fine. Yeah. Well, I'm going to say, and you don't have to agree with me, that a good place to start looking would be the military because they were in, uh, we have no doubt that they were involved in 9-11. And indeed, soldiers were seen on the ground very soon after the events. Uh, and some people said that they uh, couldn't possibly have got there that quickly. Uh, now, I don't know whether that's true, but I do. I have seen pictures of soldiers on the site, and I've got a video of them uh, actually trying to uh, prise out the radiator of a car, which is on its side, just across the road from the World Trade Center. I've got that video in one of my presentations. So, again, that's, uh, that's been videoed. That's not, not, not a theory. But, but uh, the, the military would have been brought in on a situation like that, but they wouldn't have been behind it, would they? Right, I mean, we, we, you know, they were brought in on it. What we can also establish uh, are things like the existence of companies like uh, Science Applications International Corporation. Uh, Oops, Science sorry. Applications International Corporation, it was interesting to me because I'd first come across that name in, guess what, Stephen Greer's Disclosure Project, right? Now, they're a company that are benefactors of the, what's called the Black Budget. That's the undisclosed dispense, defense spending uh, in, the, in the USA which is rumored to be in the region of at least $40 billion per year, the so-called black budget, which is the money that they spent, but they don't tell you they spent it. Science Applications International Corporation is one of the benefactors of that, uh, that budget. Uh, they do research, uh, well, before I say that, they were actually involved in writing the technical reports uh, of the destruction, about the destruction of the World Trade Center for NIST. And that, again, is not a theory, that is a fact. And you can go and look on this website and review the contract that was given to SAIC in, I think, 2003, part of the $16 million worth of funding that was given to write the 10,000 pages of technical reports uh, uh, about the destruction of the World Trade Center. Science Applications International Corporation was one of the uh, contractors, as were another company called Applied Research Associates. And they were defendants in the court action uh, not because we can prove that they did 9-11, because... The court we... action for what? What, what? what do you mean, the court action for what? Right. Well, let's, let's go back to the technical reports uh, that were produced about the World Trade Center destruction. Um, now, as most people know, the, there was the so-called Keene Commission, uh, which was, um, I think, set up in 2003, and that produced a 500-page report called the 9-11 Commission Report, headed up by, um, oh, somebody, Kane, Kane uh, I forget his first name. Uh, and that was kind of like a, an overview of supposedly what happened, you know, and how Al-Qaeda did it, and the intelligence failures, and blah, 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 blah. And, uh, you know, people like David Ray Griffin have described it as a 571-page lie. The, 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 the other report, which people seem to be less familiar with, there are two of the reports. There's a FEMA report, but the one that I'm talking about is the so-called... Um, a uh, collection of reports entitled The Collapse of the World Trade Center Towers, which was produced by NIST and published in 2005, I believe in August 2005, 10,000 pages of reports, and I've downloaded all those pages, by the way. Anyone can download them from NIST website if they go and look. They were produced at a cost of, I think, $16 million. Uh, NIST employed, I think, 23 contractors, Again, what we're looking at here is facts, not theory. This is all the evidence. And uh, two of those contractors, as I mentioned, one was Science Applications International Corporation, who were given a contract to provide consultancy about how to include, according to what's on the contract, how to include Microsoft Word equation objects in the report. Uh, I don't know why NIST needed consultancy for that, but there you go. That's what their contract says, I believe, if I remember correctly. Um, and then so is there any... Um proof of any military devices that are used in these sort of like devices. Um, no, we're not talking about that. That's, we're talking about a, a chain of evidence because what we can establish here, I think, is we know who knows who did 9-11, but we don't know who did it. In other words, if you look at what SAIC, how they you know, were involved in the events, SAIC were also in charge of ground zero security. Uh, I think from the 12th or the 13th of September 2001. Again, you can you can read that in their uh, website somewhere. I think or in various news reports. Um, 
and applied research associates with another of the defendants because they essentially what happened was when they wrote the NIST reports they committed science fraud in other words they wrote a report about the World Trade Center or part of the report uh, the aspect that they were tasked with investigating they wrote, re wrote a report which they knew was fraudulent they knew it could not be true they were paid money to produce a report which which was not true and so Dr. Judy Wood what she did was she she sued them for fraud because they accepted money uh, for a scientific report to, to, to produce that report which, which wasn't was not true and that's what she sued them for that's what she took them to court for in other words she, you know she couldn't say that they were involved in the events of 9-11 we don't we don't know whether they were or whether they, were, they weren't but what we do know uh, from the evidence is that they acted negligently they did not include the evidence they did not accurately describe what happened to the buildings uh, which was that they turned to dust. Those two contractors um, claim, and other contractors claimed that the buildings collapsed. And when you look at the evidence, that is not true. They did not collapse. They turned to dust. And you can prove that uh, by looking at all of the available evidence. So they were guilty of science fraud. Ultimately, they were guilty of um, neglig negligence, you know, uh, actions in, in their in their use of. Uh, their scientific reporting and so on, scientific analysis and so on, and writing their reports. So that's what we can prove. That case was heard and dismissed, and you can read all of those documents as to why it didn't really go anywhere, uh, not that we expected it to. Uh, but there are some interesting details about the case, uh, which you know I won't go into at this point, but I could go into if we get time later on, because there's a very important connection I want to bring out here. What? Why do you think um, they they done it or whoever they are? Because it it, it doesn't seem to be able to pin it down to one group or, or one group of elites even. So well, I, I, I'll I'll talk about what we know and then we'll move we we'll move on to speculation because I, I started off talking about the disclosure project. I just want to bring it back to that and then we'll go on to you know my own personal feelings about why and how and possibly who. Uh, although I don't really have much of an idea on that. Okay. But, but I, there's just one particular point where it brings, because you mentioned thermite a couple of times, and I can tell you another of the reasons why we know it wasn't thermite, not only because the evidence proves that it wasn't, but the person involved with, you know, first bringing out that theory, uh, we can put a time scale on that. Because Stephen E. Jones was the person who first proposed that thermite was used in the, the destruction of the World Trade Center, right? And that's not a theory, that's a fact. In September 2005, he came on to the 9-11 truth scene. And guess when September 2005 was? It was right after these 10,000 pages of NIST reports had been published for the first time. Right? Now that particular physicist, Stephen E. Jones, he used to work on a field of research known as cold fusion. Right? I don't, have you ever heard of cold fusion? Yeah, I have, but like, if you'd like to explain it from people. Right. Well, cold fusion is a, was a term that Stephen E. Jones and apparently somebody else coined in 1989. And it was coined, uh, we think now, I didn't really fully appreciate it at the time, um, to cover up uh, an energy, a very important effect, energy effect, which was discovered by two chemists named Pons and Fleischmann in 1989. Okay. And this was also another um, situation where we appeared to get, they, well, the experimenters, Pons and Fleischmann, appeared to get a lot of heat out of an experiment, but yet there were also, you know, indicators that there wasn't much heat involved. And it appeared that they were getting some nuclear reactions at room temperature in a test tube. Now, conventional physicists said that this was impossible. The only way you could get nuclear reactions was either with a very, very hot, very complicated uh, reactor known as a fusion reactor, which still hasn't been properly built because it's so complicated to get one to work, and it uses temperatures of millions of degrees centigrade to, to get this, this reaction to work. And, of course, the other type of nuclear power is known as nuclear fission, which means breaking, where you break up uh, atoms of, well, in this case, uranium, into uh, smaller atoms and then you get a, 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 a portion of matter converted to pure energy according to Einstein's equation E equals mc squared and uh, you get a very large amount of energy coming out of a very small amount of material so Pons and Fleischmann were claiming well they weren't claiming they were saying that what they look what looked like what they got was a, a form of nuclear fusion uh, and everyone said that was impossible and there was a two-year campaign 
to discredit them. And guess who is involved in that campaign? And this is written about in a book called Fire from Ice. You've guessed it. Stephen E. Jones was involved in that same campaign. And guess where else Stephen E. Jones worked? Well, guess what? He worked at Los Alamos National Laboratories, which is where they developed, guess what? The atomic bomb. So we're right back into the military-industrial complex. And this is stamped all over the story of 9-11. But very few people have investigated this and looked into this, this uh, situation. This is not a theory. Right. So do you think do you think this was um, used as a test subject for one of these sort of weapons, and then uh, the the premise of it afterwards is to go to to war with Afghanistan and go and raid? Well, those so there appear to have been a number of motives for doing it. Uh, again, we can establish what was done, and we can establish that it involved energy phenomena, which are linked to this thing called the Hutchin effect, which is also linked to. Uh, cold fusion in some way. It appears to be these things appear to be related, and something called tritium is very important here. Um, why it was done, uh, people have asked me. Well, why didn't they just say I don't know? Why didn't they, you know, let's let sort of add to your questioning. What, what, why didn't they say blow up um, the nuclear power station at Three Mile Island? You know, why? Why, why didn't they just blow something up? Or why didn't they just like bring down a whole section of buildings? in the middle of New York, you know, not just the World Trade. Why did they destroy the World Trade Center in particular? Why didn't they uh, destroy the Capitol building and, you know, and kill all the people that were in there and blah, blah, blah. Um, you know, I don't know because I don't know who the perpetrators are. I don't know who did it. Um, we, we, the, one thing I do say at this point is that if you look at some of the symbolism surrounding 9-11, it appears that that seems to be important. For example, the number 11 keeps cropping up. Uh, that seems to be important to whoever did it in some way. The two towers themselves look like a number 11. How many floors did each tower have, do you know? No. 110 floors. What do you get if you take a zero off that? Number 11 twice. Or you could say that if you count the top floor, they had 111 floors. Um, so that appears to be significant. Um, I, I, I saw a thing on the, just across from the World Trade Center was the Millennium Hotel, all right? And that is said to be, the shape of that hotel is said to be based, I think this was on their website somewhere at one time, I don't know if it still is, but it's said to be based on the shape of the monolith in Stanley Films, uh, Stanley Films, Stanley Kubrick's film, 2001, all right? What's 2001? Well, it's officially the first year of the new millennium because there was no year zero. So why was it done then? Well, it was the new millennium. So um, the, the numerology appears to, to have some bearing in, what, in what's going on. And, you know, we saw that with 772 and, and a, few other, a few other things. So whoever um, did this event and, and perpetrated it and was involved with perpetrating it appears to have some kind of uh, belief or system of numerology which they use in their operations or in their belief system or something, uh, you know. And I'm 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 not I, I don't know you know I don't really know much more than what I've told you. I've listened to various people making various points. Um, what has clearly happened with 9/11 is that it's arrested people's intellectual processes. It's arrested their ability to go down and analyze some of the information that I've presented before you in this in this hour and a half or so. They've been unable to dispassionately analyze that information for various reasons. The first reason is that 9-11 itself was, a, was a, a, an enormous trauma-based mind control operation. You know, and I was caught up in that for at least two years. I didn't even look at any. You know, I believe the official story of 9-11 for almost three years probably. I didn't even question anything, I think, until I heard a story about Michael Meacher on the radio and how he'd questioned the events. Um, but going on from there, we can also see that whoever did this, um, for example, seems to have control or influence over people like Stephen E. Jones, who you can clearly see if you study the evidence is lying. He's lying. I don't, I don't know if he knows that he's lying, but I think he knows that he's lying. Why would he lie about this? Why would he want to keep free energy covered up? You know, those are other questions which I find are very important in my mind, and I don't have any answers for them. Well, I, th I think the whole world is backwards, upside down, inside out, and screwed up to control us. Like, and I've yeah. said time and time again, the education system keeps us dumbed down. 
the, the health system keeps us sick to make money from us. Um, the, the energy, we, we could have abundance and um, not have to pay for it. And it seems like they've just got control from many, 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 many angles. Um, so exactly. like, what, what would you see as solutions to all of this? Well, the solutions to all of this is to start to, uh, you know, A, um, investigating things for yourself and, and finding out the details of, of, of some of the issues that you've mentioned there, which is, which is essentially why I created my website, because I've got some of the stuff that I've found on there, which I think proves a number of these things uh, beyond any, certainly beyond any of my doubts, as I wouldn't be, you know, spending the time uh, talking to you on the program tonight. Um, you could try and pass it on to other people, uh, and I've been trying to do that, obviously, uh, and this is part and parcel of that, that uh, those attempts. But you'll find that a lot of people will, will, you know, will resist you, and they'll, they'll, they'll just not have any interest. Um, and I think you have to begin to accept, at some level, that there is you know, something very, very profound going on here, and it's, it's, it is this shift in consciousness. You know, we're all. I think many of us were told that on you know December 21st, 2012, we we're all going to ascend to a new plane of consciousness, and the world was going to be transformed, you know, by beings of light or something. And um, um, on has... another level, uh, are you aware of um, such things as the terminology of uh, what a straw man is in the legal sense? Oh, well, essentially, yes. I mean, you, you know, you present uh, s somebody as having said something or a certain argument being made, and then you knock that argument down. Um, but actually, the argument that you knock, what, knock down wasn't what was said. It's a bit like saying uh, Dr. Judy Wood said that the World Trade Center was destroyed by ray beams from space, and clearly that's ridiculous, so it can't have been that. And, of course, she's never said that. That's essentially a straw man. Um, so no, we... no, 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 not at all, not at all, far from it. Um, there's certain things within truth movements and um, conspiracy circles where people are, are looking at the people that are controlling the world, and that's yes. the banking elites. These yes. are the ones that make all the rules, and they're above the rules. They create the legal system, they create so... the banking system, and they control people. Now, many of us are out there searching into this legal system, yes. and we've found out that the bankers have literally bonded us as slaves via our birth certificate yes. and the, the name and the creation of the language and cast this spell across us where we think that we are a name because every day at school we register in the morning and go, that's me, that's me, that's me. So that's by the end of 16 years old, you come out of school and say, I am this name. And you're not. You, you're actually admitting that you're a registered name which, in law, a right. person is legally defined as a corporation. So yes, I'm part familiar of that with system. this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, I, I'm familiar with this, and this this comes up uh, quite a lot. And it, it is one of the, I agree with you. It's one of the it is, but one of the ways in which we are controlled, and we are um, trained to think in certain ways. You know, and you use a certain type of language, as I think you were pointing out there, and you get entrained within the system. And then I think once the system has been established, uh, you know, you can either function within that system and, uh, you know, feel like a slave, or you can attempt to move outside of the system and live by your own rules, right? right um, yeah. You know, and, and, and I do know people that have tried to move outside of the system, uh, and I, I feel like doing it myself sometimes, uh, but I'm, I'm certainly not ready to do it at this point. I'll, I'll say that for my own um, part of it. Why, why would you say you're not ready? Because, like, you, you imagine uh, well, um, if you're because, not... Because, because, well, let me answer your question. Um, I feel that to disseminate the message that I have and distribute the information that I've got, I need the accoutrements within the system to, to do that you know, to carry out that process, I need to be able to buy DVDs. I need to be able to use a computer with electricity and so on to, you know, to talk to people like yourself and do these broadcasts. And so I'm still within that system uh, t to some extent, but I'm aware that at some point, you know, by doing that, I'm also aware, and this is one of the difficult dichotomies one is faced with, by doing that, I'm giving the system power. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm perpetuating the system, and I don't, I don't want to do that. So, you know, on the one hand, 
uh, you know, I'm wanting to, you know, put this information together so I give it to people and so on. But on the other, in, in doing that, I'm, I'm perpetuating the very system which is, which is enslaving so many people. So we, we can agree that it's the banking elites that are okay. part of this hierarchy system that create a body of rules to control us. But yes, it's not just them. There is something that goes beyond that as well. It's because it's been going on even before banks were created. This, this story goes back for millennia, you know, and, and I think the story also goes off planet. I, personally, I have no doubt about that. Yeah. And pe people are going to have to get used to that at some point in whatever way, shape or form. They're going to have to get used to this idea that we are part of a cosmic picture here. You know, it sounds corny to say it, and there's lots of people saying lots of things which they you know, can't prove. But, uh, so you know, I, I know where you're coming from on a cosmic level and quite much the same. We, we all have experiences and um, this, this is what we know and not necessarily pass that knowledge on because it's an experience. Right. Um, but when, when we look at things like the banking elites and them controlling the world, it, it can. We, we've got to stop looking at the, the problems out there and arguing between groups of who's right, who's wrong. And, Start finding what the solutions are. Oh, I, I agree, think. and th th I agree, but the, you know, you, you have to understand the full nature of the problem. You know, I mean, I, if you read my book, for example, 9/11: Finding the Truth, I catalog a, a whole range of weird behaviour. I mean, you know, why people would start lying about what we're saying when it's to their benefit for for, the, for them to tell the truth about it. I mean, who doesn't want free energy? You know, there is this group, whoever it is. But, that they have the power to influence people's minds directly and make them act in certain ways, you know, and I'm not just talking about, you know, Manchurian candidates going out and shooting people. They're able to influence people to actually, you know, erase certain details from their brains, you know, and, and, and until you get a handle for the, the sort of insidious ways that they work, and it's not just, you know, manipulating us through money and health care and, you know, giving us, uh, injecting us with, with viruses and all this and vaccines and so on. And it actually goes into direct control of your mind. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm totally with you on that subject as well, because the mind is the most powerful tool or yeah. muscle that the, the body has. Absolutely. And it's part of um, who, who we truly are. What is yeah. the mind? Yeah, you know, like you say, when they tell you, you know, like you were saying about, you know, you're convincing you you're a certain thing from your birth certificate and stuff, stu and stuff. That's part of it. You know, that anchors you down, I think, to some extent in this reality, and and and, and you, you know, are trained to to function in a certain way. It's you know, it's part of being trained to be a slave. Yeah, I would. I would That's agree. it. It's the whole thing. You, yeah, you are yeah. trained, and um, the, these pieces of paper have enslaved you. Yeah, and you, and you don't realise it because it's not it's not presented to you in those terms. You know, and what you said to yourself is um, you, you would love to be free from that system, but you, you wouldn't believe it. How they've programmed you is um, they've given you um, subliminals, addictions. And what you're addicted to, believe it or not, is the main fundamental, is money. You, you said, I need money to buy DVDs. And it's like a need is an addiction. It's something that you, you need to have. Oh, you know, I mean, I, I, was, I was using a certain terminology, but... What I what I mean is I don't I don't really need it as such, but um, what I, you know I, I'm trying to do a certain I'm trying to complete a certain objective, and you know I, I could for example go out and say well why don't people just send me blank DVDs, but you know maybe somebody would do it, but in the essence of time, it's quicker for me to you know I found that it's quicker for me to do the way do things the way I've been doing them to achieve the objectives that I want to achieve. So, uh, you know, that's that's the choice that I've made. But I fully accept that in making those choices, you know, I may be, may be closing off other choices which, you know, um, may be better choices. You know, you know what I mean? I'm, I'm only sort of doing the best that I can on the, on the information that I've got. Um, but, yeah, I, I, I take your point. It's like, as I say, the, the jigsaw puzzle is, is so vast. Yeah. Not one, not one man can bring it all down or, or let alone expose the whole thing. Um, the, the corruption's huge. It's, mm. it's massive. We've been going on thousands of years. Yeah. Whether this is on a physical level or, or, or just a physical level, I should say, or it, it goes beyond that is another matter which is, goes into the questionable realms of what, what can we prove 
or is right. it another truth that's being sold to people? Right. And um, for, for myself, I, I think the solutions are, like, if, if I was actually giving anybody any advice, I would say to them, don't buy my book, don't buy my DVD, <laughs> um, don't donate to me, and get out there and find out your own truth and actually really live it and find your own solutions because my solutions are not necessarily going to be solutions for you or, or anybody else. Yeah. It's, we're, we're all... Um, unique, special, and great creatures, and we've got to learn to be aware of others' differences, and and learn to live every moment, every now, every single little experience that goes on. We, we seem to dash it on by because we worry about things that don't exist from places like the past or the future, and these places don't actually exist, and that's where everybody's problems come from. Well, I also think you know one of the things I don't think we've mentioned is that. You know, I, I felt up to now, and I said this on a couple of interviews, it's not something I talk about a lot, but I have, I have mentioned it on a couple of interviews, that um, I, I feel that I've ended up in a certain position in my life at this time over the last few years, which kind of, uh, when I look back at my life, it makes it, you know, it makes it make sense, if you see what I mean. I could see that certain events have happened in my life which have made led me down a certain path, which has led me to this point. And it almost feels like I've been guided to this point um, by, I don't know, something, somehow, some way. The so, Tavistock Institute. But, no, it's Tavistock Institute. <laughs> well, you never know. It, it doesn't appear to be them, but, um, you know, uh, I'm sure there'll be some people who would say that. But, um, <laughs> uh, you know, th when I look at uh, just, just events from where I've ended up and, and the, 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 you know, I've tried to acquire certain skills, and, and ways of doing things, and that that has, those acquiring those skills have allowed me to do what I'm doing now. And you know, people have written to me and said, you know, uh, oh, I'm I'm, I'm you know, I had somebody write to me the other day, and he was somebody from the USAF, US Air Force, and he said, oh, he just simply had a one-line message from him saying, thanks for making your website, you know. And uh, I've had a few messages like that. So when you get messages like that being fed back to you. Uh, that that is almost like you get in, and I get very few saying uh, the opposite of that. I've had one or two saying, you know, you're just an idiot, and you know, this is just all BS. You know, uh, I've had one or two like that, but the vast majority of messages that I get are, you know, oh, you know, this is really good, and you know, I'm glad you've done this, and thanks for bringing this to the world and stuff like that. So, you know, that makes me feel that there is uh, this guiding thing going on and people are finding stuff out and I know I know for a fact that people are finding stuff out from what we've posted and they're getting a better understanding of what's going on around them uh, and and some of them hate you know some of them sort of one guy said I don't know whether to um, to thank you or hate you you know and he sent me quite a long message uh, and he was actually there he was actually going back to 9-11 he was actually you know at, at ground zero and he went and looked at all the damage and he didn't understand it at the time and it was only uh, ten years later, he's, he started to understand what actually happened, and and he came across my my free book, and he started reading it, and that's what what got him into looking at what went on, you know. So, can I, uh, can I ask you, um, like for yourself, where you know about all these free um, energy devices and things like this, and alternative energy, we can say, and um, what what does your own house run on? Well, I mean, we're we're pretty conventional here. We have got some solar panels. And we've got some solar water heating, but I personally, you know, I've looked at some of these energy devi energy devices and so on, and I'm pretty sure that they work, but they're extremely difficult to get hold of. And if you want to make one for yourself, again, you, you do need some basic skills, you need some uh, workspace and so on, and you know, you, you're going to have difficulty getting it to work reliably. Um, so it's you know, it's all a bit of a nebulous area, and I've got I actually got a whole presentation about that. Uh, sort of sort of situation which I've put together, but yeah, I mean we we just use pretty. We, you know, I just live on a blooming uh, ordinary housing estate, you know, in the middle of uh, uh, just outside Derby. You know, we don't have anything uh, uh, fancy or spectacular here apart from some solar panels. So, so no no um, UFO devices to fly you to and nope. from work or anything no, like that. Nothing like that. No, I mean, I, don't, I, I, you know, I don't really have it. I don't have any contacts in the military. I know a couple of people in the UFO research community and so on, but um, I so don't what, have what any. Do you, 
what is your line of work at the moment? My line of work is I, I do two jobs for the Open University. One is that I do uh, student assessments for what's called the DSA, the Disabled Students Award. And for every student that I assess, I, you know, I get paid a sum of money for each assessment that I do. Uh, and I do them, um, I mainly do them at, at De Montfort University and I do some around the Derby area. And then I do some uh, tuition on one of the Open University computer courses, uh, technology courses actually I should say. Um, I, I should be starting doing that in the next couple of weeks because there's a new course just started. So it's pretty conventional stuff, you know. Um, uh, and then I just do the website and so on. And because I'm mainly book based at home, uh, this goes back to about me saying about you know why I've ended up in the situation because I'm mainly based at home I can do updates to the website I can send emails I can do printouts and send people booklets and discs and DVDs uh, in my own time you know I can do that here while I'm here at home and I don't get interfered with you know there's nobody at the office saying oh you can't do that or you know I haven't got to wait for anybody to do things for me I can do it all myself um, so that allows me to disseminate this information uh, you know my own in my own free will. Okay, so if we, if we were to cap the night off tonight, um, we both agreed at 9-11, very, very suspect, probably not done by Muslims hiding in caves. <laughs> um, we, we could agree that the banking elites are control, controlling the world, uh, manipulating every angle of people's lives through healthcare, education, media, workforce, everything, public service sector, you name it, they're there. Right. Um, for, for me, I, I, I will never know, I don't think, um, what actually caused the Twin Towers to fall or anything like that. I know that it was a very suspect um, day of um, what happened and what happened afterwards and what's happened to humanity and the legal system since. It's just been completely raped and people's rights have been taken away from them. Um, I, I can't see a, a device or any evidence connecting to a device a frequency device, even though I, I, I love that information, I look into it. Have you Not read the book? And um, what, your book? No, J Dr. Wood's book. I haven't, I'm afraid, no. Right. Have you watched the videos? Um, I've watched a few, yeah. Right. Well, as I say, once you've read those books, people, people that have read them end up knowing what happened. Um, it's just a question but of looking at This is tying well. it to the information that's the Hutchinson effect, right. isn't it? Correct. Yeah, and, it, and you can and read my book as well because that why, that that becomes obvious then that it, that is the correct thing, you know, to, to tie it up to if you if you read the evidence in that you'll see. But to get to get that them things going, you need equipment, and the equipment. Right. What, it, what was the equipment? Was it just the the? We don't know exactly. We don't know exactly what the equipment was. What I proposed. Isn't uh, that where it becomes a theory then? Yes, at that point yeah. it does. Yes, it does. But what we can, what isn't a theory is what actually happened. And there is only one way what happened could have happened, right? Okay, so we, so we can both agree that, like, it was definitely a suspect day of... Right, something you can also, you can also establish uh, the things that I've established as being true. None of what I spoke about is a theory, right? The things that, the, the things that are theor theoretical is where the weapon was, who owns it, who's flicked the switch, and uh, the exact nature in which it operates. Right. It's a bit like saying, you know, um, you know, a car drives down the road. Uh, you know, what did, was it a, a, a petrol car? Was it a diesel car or was it an electric car? You know, because the car has been and gone, you might be able to smell it. Therefore, you would know that it was a diesel or a petrol. But if there was no smell, you could probably say that it was an electric car. But then again, it might have been freewheeling with the engine off, so you might not have known. But you'd still know it was a car, you know, it had four wheels, you know, it had some type of propulsive force in it. Do you see what I mean? We can know those those details. Okay, cool. Right, we're, we're just running up to the hour, so one, okay. one last little message before we run into the music, and then the Dark City crew will be going on together. But, like, what would you say to people if people had to look in one direction for solutions? I, I would personally say stop registering your children you're, you're actually handing them over and making them government property what, what would you say for a solution to the listeners oh that's that's quite a tough one but what, what I've tried to do is we need the people that are running the system on our side so you need to try and get the attention of people within the system be they bankers be they registrars and so on to the sorts of topics that we 
you know, have investigated for ourselves. Um, how you do that is, is a tough one. You know, I, I haven't had a lot of success myself. Just to give an example, I wrote to all the uh, UK police forces and told them that they need to do their own investigation into what happened on 9-11. And uh, also I wrote to a number of military bases to, with the same information. That was in 2008, and that's in my book. So we need to get people within the system on our side. I think, you know, there are some very small signs that that might be happening in a, in a small way. Um, so that would be my one of my solutions. For, for myself, um, I, I don't know. If I recognise the corruption, then like, I, I wouldn't want to try and help that corruption in any way because corruption is corruption. I've, I've, I've sat there yeah. myself personally with another experience um, getting attacked for my truths and spreading them. And then because you're trying to befriend this guy who's going to just attack you anyway, what's the point of, of helping a cancer? You may as well just, um, for me, right. I, couldn't, I couldn't stick up for the banking system the way it enslaves people, the way the monetary system is. It's a middleman. We, we're not interacting with each other anymore. We're not having eye contact. When Humanity's being lost little bit by little bit with all these rules and regulations yep. set upon humanity every day. And you have to use this money and claim your name to survive in the system and if, if you can't use that you've got to tweak the system I think people if they rec recognize the corruption step away from that system anyway we've got one minute left any last words Andrew well I just say you know yeah I, I agree with that and um, it, it, you know each one of us can try and change things in the way that we feel empowered to change them um, and if you want the information that I've looked at go and look at uh, drjudywood.com well, check the evidence.com and Dr. Judy Wood's book is available from wheredidthetowersgo.com. Okay, and thank you very much, everyone, for listening. And uh, it's been a, a struggle tonight, but it's been a good night. Thank you very much, Andrew. Thank you, Bob Thanks. Crew.